My Jesus, I love thee. for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for guiding us all to church this morning, for being with us throughout the week. I thank you for waking us up this morning and for allowing us to spend time together to learn more about you and to have fellowship in you. I pray that now as I speak about the topic of building on family, that my words will come from you and that the people may be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so for Sabbath school this morning, the topic is building up family. Not building on family, building up family. Um, so when I, when I was given this topic, I decided that I want to share something about my own family. And I don't think I've done that at our church in the four years that I've been here. So uh, I want to share a little about my own family. Uh, my family dynamic, or I guess more so my parents, I come from an Adventist family. Um, so going to church on the Sabbath was something that we did on a regular basis. Not really my dad, but my mom has always been more conservative and more strict. And as a teenager and even beyond, I often felt very suffocated. And I don't know if people can relate to that um, when you were a teenager, but I, I definitely felt like my mom was putting me in this place and I really wanted to get out of it. So my mom and I clashed on a lot of our values, our morals, and our life decisions. And to be honest, to this day, we still do. Um, I am the younger child in my family, so I have an older sister I'm the younger one and also the youngest one. And in my family, as a child, um, especially as a teenager, I, I was very quiet and reserved. I had a lot of secrets that I did not share with my parents or my sister. Um, and I tried to stay out of conflict because I would rather avoid them than face them, which is very unhealthy now when I look back. But the question I had to ask myself while preparing for this topic was, was my family a family of God? And I encourage you to think about this as well for your own families. I, I believe now looking back, now that I don't live with my family anymore, I have my own place, I'm more independent, I, when I reflect on it, I think in, parts, in some parts, yes, my family was a family of God, but then in other parts, we weren't. And I don't know how many people can relate to this, but 
When I was younger, I saw my parents as um, almost, they were the closest thing to perfection. And they could do no wrong, they could say no wrong. And, you know, they were always there to defend me. And I saw them as these amazing people who did not make mistakes until I was around 14 or 15 years old. And that's when the standard of perfection that I used to see them as completely changed. And I saw them as, I saw them as sinners who Jesus came to die for. And I saw them as children of God who, who God loves so much. And so having that change of perspective, of that perception of the way I saw my family, especially my parents, well, my sister too. Um, I feel like I keep talking about my parents, but my, my sister is also very relevant in my life. Um, there are things that I really appreciate about my family, now looking back. And I wrote some things down that I wanted to share. I really appreciated the morning devotions that my dad would do with us every morning before breakfast at the dining table. He would do a short morning devotion, which kind of set the tone for the day and for our family. I appreciated that going to church on the Sabbath was normal, that I don't think I ever missed a day. Um, and even when I was sick, my parents would still take me to church. And I, one thing I really appreciated, more than any other thing, more than going to church, more than doing devotions, was receiving sincere apologies from my parents. And I think I appreciated that so much because it was a true act of godliness. And it showed that while going to church and devotions are very important, um, sincere apologies, telling me that they're sorry for what they did or what they said the other day or whatever it may be, that really showed me a character of Jesus. And that's where I, I think I learned a lot too. So overall, my family has tried to be a family of Christ, and they still do. But in many ways, we have failed. Um, and I think one of the reasons is possibly because my family, and I'm not just talking about the members of my family, but myself as well, as I am also a member, um, I think we put religion above spirituality, especially growing up, which is probably why we, why, why the whole topic of building up family in Christ was sometimes... Um, we, we couldn't reach that goal sometimes. So I decided to write down a few things I would do differently when I have my own family in the future. I think I would focus on spirituality and a godly home rather than religion or reputation. I would rather show respect to my children and try to live peaceably. And now I wanna share with you a verse, a Bible verse that I found um, and it really spoke to me directly, and, it's, and I think God was really speaking to me that this is the basis, the foundation of what it means to build up family in Christ, which is in Colossians 3.15, and it says, And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. And so in this verse, you can see that the peace that that comes from Christ. When you pray for peace in Christ, God definitely gives it to you. And I have experienced that in my life. Um, and the one body that is your family, the family is one body. The members of that family is, is you and the other members of your family. And God tells us that we should live in peace that we should strive to live in peace, and that we should always be thankful. So I want you to ask yourselves, are you, are you striving for peace in your family? And are you being thankful in your family? And so these are some things that this verse, this verse to me shows me the kind of family that I want to build. And it also puts into perspective like how my family was growing up now that I I'm out of the nest, 
t to say. Um, so it kind of, it really puts things into perspective in a more clear way. Um, okay, I don't expect this to be so short. <laughs> when I was re like reviewing it, rehearsing it, it actually took a lot longer. But um, we're on our last, last slide. Um, a few things that I wrote down, I really believe that each family has their own generational habits. So my family has them. My family has like generational traditions and habits that came from like my great great grandparents and they still live on to this day because of Korean culture and traditions and how just how our family was built. And I want you to evaluate the generational habits that you have in your family. So the good and the bad, the good and the destructive. And I want you to write down like destructive generational habits of your family and ask God for help to transform those habits to godly habits that would lead your family into godliness. And honestly, I'm not the perfect person to speak on building up family because I don't have, I don't have a family of my own. Um, I'm 21 years old. <laughs> There's so much that I don't know about family. So it was really, it was actually hard to prepare for this. But um, what I can say on this topic and what God has told me is if you don't have godliness in your family, then there's no point. And the whole point of Christianity is that we all want to go to heaven. And if you have those generational destructive habits, if you do not transform them, they will be transferred to your children and to your grandchildren and on and on. So to me, it is very imperative that those habits are broken and that they are changed and transformed to godly habits. Um, last but not least, I want to share uh, the last point. I think that in the church and also just young people in general, we we are always told, pray for your future husband, pray about him, who he is, and um, just a whole bunch of what to pray about your future husband, that there are books out there, just thick books, and it's all about praying for your future spouse. And I think that's wonderful. I think that's very important. But what people often forget is they don't pray about their future family. And I actually started to pray about my future family about two years ago. And I was like, I started to list things that I want my future children to have, qualities that I want them to have, as well as my future husband. But I, to me, um, it's so important that you pray for your future family and for the godliness of your future family. And there is never, it's never too early to pray about that, no matter how young you may be or where you are in life. So that is very important. And for God to prepare you for your future role. So that is what I'm going to leave you with this morning. I hope you have gained something. And um, yeah, what I wrote down in the last slide, I titled it, What You Can Do. So hopefully that can inspire you and maybe you can think deeper of your personal families and what habits you may have that need to be changed in Christ. Uh, so that will be it for our Sabbath school lesson. A Sabbath school, yeah, Sabbath school lesson. And um, now we will sing our closing song, Safely Through Another Week. Let's go ahead and sing uh, Safely Through Another Week, number 384. 384.
let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Sabbath school, and I thank you for the Sabbath where we can rest and come together to learn something about you, especially on our topic today, building up family. I pray that people have been blessed, that you have spoken to them in their hearts, and that their lives will be changed, their families will be changed and renewed. I pray that you will continue to be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, thank you, everyone. And now, after a short break, we will have our divine service. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Good morning. I hope you've all had a lovely week, but if you have not, I hope you can find some rest in today's Sabbath. Let's start with our song service. We will sing, I will sing of Jesus' love. I will sing of 
Jesus loves sing of Him, who first loved me for He left. But was above and died on Calvary. I will sing of Jesus.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. Yeah, we sincerely welcome you to our worship service. And uh, we also welcome those you who are attending the worship by online. It is very humid and hot summer weather. Above all, we pray uh, your health. And we also pray God be with you and your family always. Uh, it seems that uh, there are many people the, in the home country and abroad in, because it is a vacation. We pray that God be with them wherever they are. Uh, I would like to introduce a guest or a person who came to first time in our sub, uh, worship service. No? Okay, please introduce yourself. Oh, okay, the, he is a tape, maybe the special the number, okay? Okay, welcome with our all her heart. Michelle, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Welcome. Amen. Amen. So now uh, we are starting the, our worship service with a silent prayer. God bless you. Thank you very much. Let us now stand as we sing our introit, Open My Eyes That I May See. Gracious Heavenly Father, 
on this blessed Sabbath morning, we feel the warmth and love from you. It is truly a peaceful and wonderful day of worship. The seventh day, this holy day of God gives us peace and strength from heaven above. So, Lord, we want to thank you for bringing us to this house of worship and letting us experience the love of God through our worship programs. Oh, Lord, we invite your holy presence in the midst of us. Please dwell in our hearts so we'll be ready to meet you face to face personally. Oh God, be with all our church members, whatever they are, maybe in this very chapel or at their homes, Lord. Please be with them and let them tune their hearts to the message from heaven above. And also be with all our church brethren on earth, Wherever they are, Lord, there are more than 25 million people are worshiping today, and they are the Sabbath keepers. Oh God, please bless them. Wherever they are, in the midst of their agonies and difficulties and trials and calamities, we pray that your heavenly peace of this holy Sabbath day shall come upon them, and they will feel the presence of God through their worship experience. Oh God, now we are starting our worship, so we invite you to dwell in our hearts and control our minds and thoughts so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. We love you, Lord. We thank you everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's remain standing for our opening hymn, O Day of Rest and Gladness. Oh, oh, oh. Your grace is ever. 
Let us kneel in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we praise your name. Thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for guiding us every day in our daily life. In particular, we thank you for allow allowing us to gather to worship the Lord on the Sabbath day. Please be with the Holy Spirit in our hearts today. Forgive us for being lazy in reading the Bible and praying. We want to be fully restored through this time of worship. Lord, come to our heart and be the time to meet the Lord with us spiritually. Let us be our lives with your word and rely on them to become us who do our best. Help us to be more like you. We want to reflect your life in all that we do. Help us to love our neighbors, to forgive, forgive those who have hurt us, and to live a life that is worth of your name. We hope to be washed clean through your mercy. Please make our sinful heart as white as white snow again. Change our lives, lives through your word today. Allow the pastor sin who will deliver today's message to be full of the Holy Spirit. Please remember the hand the honors God with beautiful performance with music. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer today. Let us listen to your voice and live in your presence every day. Amen. Father, we love you. Pray in the name of Jesus, who loves us. Amen. Amen. There's a call going out across the land in every nation. I call to all who swear allegiance to the cross of Christ. I call to true humility to live our life responsibly. To deepen our devotion to the cross at any price Let us then be sober, moving only in a spirit As aliens and strangers in a hostile foreign land the message we're proclaiming is repentance and forgiveness. The offer of salvation to a dying race of men. To love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission. The spring for which our service overflows Across the street or around the world 
the mischievous children sing, proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name. As a candle is consumed by the passion of the flame, spilling light and sparingly. Throughout a darkened room, let us burn to know Him deeper than a service flaming bright. We radiate His passion and blaze it, holy light. To love the Lord our God. Is the heartbeat of our mission The spring for which our service overflows Across the street, all around the world The mission's children say Proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name To love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission The spring for which our service overflows Across the street, all around the world The mission's children say Proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name The heartbeat of our mission The spring for which our service overflows Across the street, all around the world The mission's tell the same Proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name To love the Lord our God Is the heartbeat of our mission This is the children's story time. Children, come here. Please sit in the front. together. Maybe you can go back. Hi, children. How are you? Good? Yeah. Um, today, uh, our storyteller is kind of a little bit late. So while we are waiting for her, I mean, she's going to be here soon. We are going to spend some time talking about what did you do in the last, last week. So who want to share what was the favorite thing you did for during the last week? Huh? What is it? I like Oh, you eat pizza. So you like it, right? So others, who want to share? Oh. Well, what did you do? Going to the kids cafe. Going to ah kids cafe. So what did you do in the kids cafe? You play. So what did you play with? A zip line. A 
zip line. Wow. So you had the last part, right? Oh. Um, is there anyone who have to summon and then that happy make you happy? Hajun, did you do something for your, ki uh, your friends last of us and then last week? Yeah, so can you share with us what did you do for your friends? Play. 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 Play and play basketball. Play basketball. Okay, good. So I think. Our story teller is here now. Uh, thank you, <laughs> children. Please welcome your today's story teller, Danielle Kim, <laughs> with her lovely kids, Hannah. Happy Sabbath, Danielle. I cannot hold that. Oh, okay. I will. I want to help you out. I had a baby. <laughs> Actually, when I first had him, he was 2.67 kilograms. Do you know how heavy that is? Not very heavy, right? But now he's over 6 kilograms. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. No, no, he cannot. He's eating. Okay, so, <laughs> so um, he's gotten a little bit bigger, right? A little bit bigger. He's doubled in weight. Actually, he's changing a lot. When I first got him, when he first came to us, he was very skinny. But now he's a bit chubby. I'll show you later. He's unhappy right now. This goes perfectly with my story. Okay. So <laughs> when I was, uh, when he first came to us, he his poop was black, and now it's yellow. And now it's yellow. Actually, a lot of things have changed, but one thing hasn't changed. He can't talk. I want him to talk. I tried teaching him more and food and uh, hungry. But all he does is this. He just cries. So I can't understand him. And sometimes I can't understand him, so he feels very frustrated, like now. And I realized that when he gets older, he will say, Mommy, give me this. Mommy, I want this. Mommy, help me. Mommy, love me. He will say all of these things. But right now, he can't say those things. So all he can do is cry. And I realized that God is always listening to us, just like our parents. When I'm trying to help him, I can't understand him sometimes. But God always understands me. God always understands you. So all we have to do is call on God, and he will help you better than your parents do. A uh, verse we have is Psalm 50, 15. God says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you, and you will honor me. And then Psalm 116, 2 says, because he has climbed his ear to me, therefore I shall call upon him as long as I live. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us the ability to call on you. Help us to cry to you when we need you and remember you always. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Thank you, children. Thank you, children. You can go to You can go to the next door. Yes, now this is the time our children will go to their own classroom and they will have another good time. All right. 
Daniel, thank you so much for bringing your lovely child, Hanel, and giving us a very special message. Yes, cry out to the Lord. Because our Heavenly Father, He understands our language. We don't need to speak, you know, the clear vocabularies or sentences or phrases because our God, as He, he is listening to our cries, He knows what we need. Maybe he's hungry, he's thirsty, or he's aching, you know, whatsoever. So let us cry out, just like a baby Hano, but Mother uh, Daniel knows and understands everything. By the way, uh, Mr. Joe, who sang just a while ago, the mission, I believe he's gone. Oh, he's there. Mr. Joe, thank you so much for that powerful song which was the theme song of the Golden Angels and, you know, his M, the Thousand MM, the official singing group. I always chose that song as the theme song and the first and the best, the most song because that tells about our mission. Praise the Lord. All right. You might be a little wondering... Why Pastor Shin is not wearing a suit, but, you know, kind of... This is a Filipino baron, by the way. A very traditional cloth. And I love to wear, but, of course, in Korea, I seldomly, well, almost not. But today, I select to wear this one because it relates to my topic. Well, as a series of sermons, for seven series sermons, now I'm going to give you the fourth message today. And I'm dealing the things that should rule our faith. From this land of darkness, from this world, going to heavenly paradise, what kind of things should rule over our faith so that we could reach the heavenly paradise without any problem? Well, can you figure out the characters? The first one, brother. Of course, Adam and Eve. The second one, Joseph. And the third one, High Priest Aaron. And the fourth one, uh -huh. Mr. Aiken. Okay. All right. The, the next one, Elijah and Elisha. And the last one, and the next one. Woman subject to bleeding for 12 years. And the very last one, Jesus and you and me. All right, today the topic is clothing governs behavior. Clothing governs behavior. How many of you do agree with this title? Yes. Like a military look. Soldiers are functioning good and well, great. Yeah, whenever they are wearing their combat, you know, uniform, with combat boots, with rifles and everything, if they are wearing, you know, like a little short waves, this and that, they would not functioning well as a great military man. Sportsmen, they have to wear their own suit, like swimmers. They have to wear, you know, you know the swimming suit. And tennis player or rock climber or mount biker, you know, depends on their own choices. They have to wear the right feet of their suit. Otherwise, they won't uh, feeling well and doing well. As I've given you these many characters in the Bible, I would say... This is, the, by, by the way, the stories from the Bible, and it is talking about our earthly lives. This is the gospel progress from the creation to the recreation, from Genesis to the book of Revelation. It is all talking about the what? History of clothing. Let's see. The very first, yeah, it begins with, the clothing story of Adam and Eve. After the fall, yes, God provided a very special cloth for them. And in the end, as we finish or end our lives on earth, the earthly history will be ending with this picture. Jesus will give us the robe of righteousness. 
the robe of white. Well, I have many different kinds of clothes, especially the uniforms. As you know, the Pathfinder uniform. My nickname is Mr. Pathfinder. I lived for youth and children all my life, so I love to be called Mr. Pathfinder. And I have the other one is the youth director uniform that I had, you know, the blue jacket and little kind of this kind of, you know, khaki uh, pants. And then uh, a little like in you know, a light blue shirt with a white necktie, which is a red collar. That is my uniform, and I love to wear that one. You know, whenever I'm wearing that one, I, I, my youngness, I, my youthfulness is coming up. You know. And the third one, which is now I'm wearing, can you see here? The actually, you know, the fire flame of the Holy Spirit and the globe and the thousand mm. Actually, here on here, three angels are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. So whenever I'm wearing this uniform, I feel that I must do for the world mission. I'm going to give you a very short message related to uh, this uniform. And I have doctor's gown. And the last one, I have a baptismal gown, which I love to wear. I want to wear all the time. But, you know, whenever I have a baptismal candidate, then I can wear. So, you know, sometimes it often or or sometimes is quite rare. By the way, next Sabbath, I'm going to baptize a fifth grader, which means, you know, the senior of the architect uh, department, Ms. Guk Da Young. She is 176 centimeter height, exactly the same with me. And then she is beautiful. And somehow she studied at Samyo for five years, and finally she accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. So it, it, it will be a very joyful moment. By the way, related to this uh, particular uniform, I want to give you why I'm wearing this. During my directorship of the Thousand MM in the Philippines, I visited Korea and I visited one particular company. And then I met the president of the company. And I explained about the 1,000 mm and the ministry and the function of this 1,000 mm as the world headquarters, which training, training, and educating about nearly, you know, uh, 200 young people every single year, sending out to the world for the gospel progress. And then he was listening. At the time, I was wearing my, you know, youth director uniform, a kind of, you know, nice suit with necktie and like that. And after he was listening to my you know, information about the 1,000 mm, all of, a, all of a sudden he was asking, Pastor Shin, you are the director of the 1,000 missionary movement, 1,000 missionary movement. Do you have your, your uniform? I said, yes, I have. Then he asked me, then why didn't you wear that one and visit my company? You are the director of the 1,000 mm, but you are not wearing the uniform of the 1,000 mm. I was quite embarrassed <laughs> and listening to him. You know, he is telling me, you know, when I was visited by a certain man who was the director of the one organization of our church, he visited me with that humble uniform of the particular organization. I was so much impressed. That very day, in front of him, I donated 100 million won, Irogon. And he said, because I saw him, his spirit, with his organization. So he told me, Pastor Shin, if you come and visit me again with your uniform, I would donate more money for your ministry. That day, I could not forget. Of course, he donated one, uh, $10,000, which is 1,000,000 won. Then, you know, yearly basis, 
천만 원, or 이천만 원, you know, hundred thousand, or uh, no, ten thousand dollars, or twenty thousand dollars, even three, uh, thirty thousand dollars. He continually uh, donated for our organization. By the way, that single day, I was really touched and impressed. Although I was, you know, so much uh, kind of embarrassed and shameful, because he was telling me the spirit of my ministry. Pastor Shin, you are the director of the Thousand MM, so you must wear the uniform of the organization. Not showing kind of, you know, in a good, goodness of a suit, nice shoes. No. You better wear your uniform so that you will give kind of natural information, natural advertisement of your organization to other people. That's why I'm wearing. Since then, Whenever I come out to Korea or going to any other places, when I stand in front of many people, I always were wearing this uniform of the thousand m m My dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to get through from the one image to another, and we are going to learn from that particular image. All right. The first one is Adam and Eve. As we all know that, they fell. And they did sin against God. They broke the commandments of God and did not follow. Because of that, sin came in and the death, the, which was the result of the sin, came into the human race. And all of you and I will die someday. Hopeless and helpless. But by the grace of God, somehow it was changed. You know, let's see, right after the sin came to Adam and Eve, what they have felt. This is the message. The air, which had hitherto been of a mild and uniform temperature, seemed to chill the guilty pair. The love and peace which had been theirs was gone. And in its place, they felt a sense of sin, a dread of the future. A nakedness of soul, the robe of light which had enshrouded them, now disappeared. And to supply its place, they endeavored to fashion for themselves a covering. For they could not, while unclothed, meet the eye of God and the holy angels. After the four, they gained some. You know, here in this uh, quotation, they said they lost three, uh, they gained three things. A sense of sin and a dread of the future and nakedness of soul. They got these three results out of their sinning experience. And they lost one. What was that? The love and peace they lost. And what they lost, another one is the robe of light. When God created Adam and Eve, they were naked. I don't know, what should I say? They were not like, uh, naked because they were wearing a robe of light. We do not know what kind of light or what kind of quality. The material was light. I believe it gave kind of warmth. And the peace, you know, our emotional feelings. Because once it was gone, it disappeared. They felt what? A chilling experience. Something is cold and something is different than before. And finally, because of their sin, God has to move them out of the Garden of Eden. Why? If they continually eat, the fruit from the tree of life, they will live forever and ever with their sins, which is not good for them. So God has to bring them out of the Garden of the Eden, and then this is, was the experience they had. The day when they are going out, look at this, in humility and unutter unutterable sadness, they bade farewell to their beautiful home and went forth to dwell upon the earth. We rested the curse of sin. Look at this. The atmosphere 
once so mild and uniform in temperature, was now subject to marked changes. And the Lord mercifully provided them with the garment of skins as a protection from the extremes of heat and cold. Yes, we are covering our body. You know, it's, now it's quite chilly because of the air conditioning power in this room now. You see, right? Whenever you need to cover up for good warmth, you have to cover with the skin. I mean, kind of, you know, clothes. And when you are really hot, do you think that you will be naked or you will be covering? If you are in the desert with your own skin, you will be burnt. Because, you know, over 50 and all nearly 55 Celsius, you cannot bear the heat. Although you're, you are perspiring and sweating, you need to cover your body. So since God knows the Adam and Eve will experience this, out of the Garden of the Eden. That's why God provided a garment of skin to protect them from the extremes of heat and cold. So what, I will, what can we learn from this? As mother provides clothes for the baby, just like Daniel and Youngjin, you know, Caleb and Daniel, they already provided the baby's clothes before the baby came out. Just like that, our Heavenly Father, before Adam and Eve fall, God already provided the plan of redemption and at least two lambs in the Garden of Eden were killed and gave the skin to these two human beings. In other words, the love relationship through this skin, uh, the robe of skin, was provided, and that was the beginning of our relationship with God. The second one, Joseph. We know the story well, so I will not remind you all the story of this man. By the way, Jacob, who had a 12 sons, now he has the 11th one. The, the 11th and 12th, the, the very last two sons were given by his beloved wife, Rachel. So he loved Joseph more than any other sons. You know, he shouldn't do that, but unfortunately, Jacob was a man, normal man like you and I, because he has a kind of partial love for this boy. So the Bible says he, provide, he made a richly ornamented, uh, ornamented robe. It seems that it's not that rich, but, you know, there should be kind of, you know, some accessories on the cloth. So it was maybe shining and well-designed, many different colors and shining. So the boy was really happy with that. But the other ten brothers were angry with this. This morning, Sister Michelle shared you know, how to build up good family, and I was really inspired. Thank you so much. You, when, when she was only 19, she was praying about her future, you know, building a family. And now 21, she's making good plans for, you know, her future, you know, building up the family. That was a good plan. So I hope that you will, you know, continually keep that mind and uh, making, you know, little more details and better program for your family. By the way, here it says, the father's injudicious gift to Joseph of a costly coat or tunic, such as was usually worn by person of distinction, seemed to them another evidence of his partiality and excited a suspicion that he intended to pass by his older children to bestow the birthright upon the son of Rachel. So the other ten brothers, older brothers of Jacob, were angry with this because they were thinking, especially the Reuben, the firstborn child, he might be, you know, cautious and, you know, curious. Maybe my father, since he loves this child very much, maybe he will pass this birthright from me and given to this 11th son, which is not lawful. So he was not able to understand this. And it's been spread. 
and uh, 11, uh, actually 10 older brothers uh, got angry with Joseph. But by the grace of God, somehow, Joseph was the man of God, very faithful, loyal to God and, uh, you know, his family, especially although he had, you know, power and the position, title, like a prime minister of the kingdom of Egypt, rather than revenging his 10 older brothers. Instead, he forgave them and he accepted and he inherited all the good things to his brothers. By the way, I want to give this maxim from English, I believe. The weak revenge. The strong forgive. The wise forget. Again, the weak 연약한 사람은 revenge, 보복하고 the strong, 강한 자는 forgive, 용서하고 the wise, 지혜로운 자는 forget, 잊어버린다. What kind of person do you want to be? The weak? I hope the strong and the wise. Now the third one, which is the most important in this you know, sermon? High priest. Can you imagine Joshua and Moses went up to the Mount Sinai, which was more than 2,500 meter high, Rocky Mountain. In the night, of course, very cold. In the day, very hot. By the way, after he went up to this high mountain, they did not come down for 46 days. The pen of inspiration said that Joshua and Moses, they went up and for six days they were eating, you know, some bread and maybe they were drinking the stream water from the Mount Sinai. But on the 40th, uh, sixth day, seventh day, God called Moses to come into his presence. So Joshua was left behind and only Moses went into the presence of God. We do not know where, but of course, should be the peak of the mountain. And now it's a personal time with God and Moses alone. You just imagine, for 40 days, they spent time together. I don't think that Moses was sleeping on the mountain. Rather, I believe by the power of God, he was able to awaken all 40 days. And God was busy and Moses was busy. God was busy to teach the things must be built and done in the hands of Moses. And Moses was so busy to learn how to build the temple of God and how to make the robe of high priest. Can you imagine? Moses was the first leader. He was the top and he is the leading force of his people. But now God is talking something new to this man. You are the leader, but I'm going to set a system and a person, new system, priesthood. Moses never heard. And there was a, no such a system in God and between God and his people. God is now gave his new design and new idea to Moses. And Moses had to understand this new system. And above all, God is now talking about a special cloth which even Moses never wore before. And now he's saying, your older brother Aaron is the one. And you have to make this kind of wonderful clothes for him. So whenever he is ministering in the house of Tabernacle, since he will be the mediator, very symbolic person, and for the you know, Christ's Messianic ministry, he must be wearing these holy garments from the turban to the, to the very center. Everything must be perfectly done, and they have to respect this. By the way, when God and Moses were talking about these tabernacle things and the robe of righteousness, the you know, high priesthood robe, what was happening down below of Mount Sinai? We already know the story. Look at this. Aaron, the very person, when God and Moses was talking about this new system and new cloth, 
Aaron feared for his own safety and instead of nobly standing up for the honor of God, he yielded to the demands of the multitude. His first act was direct that the golden earrings be collected from all the people and brought to him, hoping that pride would lead them to refuse such a sacrifice. But they willingly yielded up their ornaments, and from these he made a molten, molten calf in imi imitation of the gods of Egypt. The people proclaimed, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron basely permitted this insert to Jehovah. He did more, seeing with what satisfaction go, uh, the golden God was received. He built an altar before it and made a proclamation, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. This was what Aaron did. So, you know, when I read the Bible, this really, this part I could not understand. Although God designed something good for him and his people, putting a man as a mediator between God and his people, functioning as a Christ, but or prepared the design and system was ruined by this one single event because Mr. Aaron was not qualified to be wearing and to be functioning such a godly thing. So what happened? Moses came down with the two tablets of God's commandments and then he broke, he threw the two tablets and what happened? Actually, on that very day, Aaron must be killed because of his great sin. But as you look at this, the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. But in answer to the honest intercession of Moses, his life was spared. If you are a human being like Moses, can you accept this? Moses and God spent 40 days and designing all this new priestly, you know, the system and the clothes for the high priest. And as you are coming down, you look at the very person who will be going to wear that glorious cloth. But now he's doing something against God. But Moses, this man of perseverance, man of you know, long patience, he was praying to the Lord for his older brother. Lord, you told me that you will be designing this and you will anoint my brother and let him function as the man of mediating between you and your people. But if you are killing him, who will be the next? And who will get this kind of godly function? Oh, Father God, please, please forgive him. So he was forgiven and he was now anointed. Let me tell you, Aaron was what? Man of sin. He did many wrong things against God, even against his own brother. We had an issue about, you know, his jealousy upon his brother, and especially, you know, uh, his uh, sister-in-law, Moses' wife. And then Miriam became a leper. And then he, both of them were to be killed by God. But again, Moses prayed for them and Aaron was forgiven. But let me tell you, once Aaron was wearing this holy garment of high priesthood, he was changed. That's why I set the title for this Sabbath, Clothing Governs Behavior. If you clothe holy garment, I'm talking about the spiritual things. I'm not talking about the fashion or length or you know, thickness or 
you know, whether that is transparent or not, I'm talking about the very quality of the cloth, the spirit of the cloth. This man, although he was sin, sinner, and he was against God, against his own brother Moses, his spiritual leadership, but once he was wearing this holy garment, his life was changed little by little, and he really became a godly man. So what you and I are wearing are very important. Now, let's see the next one. Achan. We know the story. Joshua brought his people across the Jordan River, and they reached the first city in the Gentile city, the Palestine. That was the city of Jericho. And we know the story. And they conquered the city, and now they enter into the city. And Joshua's command upon, by the, hand, you know, the mouth of the Lord, you slaughter everything, and you do not take any plunder from the city of Jericho. But this man Achan, he was covetous. And he said, but the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to, to the devo uh, devoted things. Achan, son of Kalmi, the son of Zemri, the son of uh, Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burnt against Israel. Now let me give you a question. You know, it was a personal, individual matter. Because out of millions of people, only Achan did this wrong thing. Then how come God is angry with his people? Not person to person, but person to a group, a nation. Because of Achan's individual wrongdoing, God was angry with the whole people of Israel. We know the result. After they called Jericho, you know, they what, sent only 3,000 soldiers and went to the invade the what, city of Ai. But they lost, they were defeated, and 36 soldiers were killed by the hands of enemies. Then why? Why did God treat this Achan's personal sin as the sin of the nation? And why did the innocent 36 people, of course, I cannot say whether they are innocent or, you know, uh, sin, sin people. Of course, I believe there are no perfect beings. So to the sight of God, these 36 might be killed by the hands of enemies. But anyway, it seems that it is not fair. The next Bible, now Joshua 7.1 is, uh, actually it's not 7.1, Joshua 7.21. Here says, When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wage of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So all of a sudden, he had a desire for worldly fashion. Look at that, you know, it's like a glorious shining robe like Joseph's. It was sin in his eyes. And all of a sudden, he got this. You know, let me tell you, when we are sinned by something, if you had desire in your heart, then that instant encounter will bring the quiet great result. For instance, if you are immortal, always thinking of some, you know, pornography or something bad and immortal things, if you look at, the, you know, the like a screen or, or something on the pictures, all of a sudden you'll be doing that. If you are covetous, you are looking for, a, you know, gold or silver or dollars, or, you know, big money. And if that is on the chair or in the taxi or in the bus, Nobody is, you know, going around. Then you will steal. Why? You've been desiring that in the heart. So somehow, Mr. Aiken, it was not by that instant encounter, but he had a kind of desire to these worldly matters. So when he was looking at this, you know, beautiful robe of the Babylonia, 
He was tempted, and he did. And not only this beautiful robe, but he added silvers and golds, and now put under his tent. And this is the message. Let me read this. How common even here to find the selfishness of verses, overreacting, uh, overreaching, neglect of uh, charities and robbery of God in the tithes and the offerings. Among church members, in good and regular standing, there are alas, many achans. Many a man comes stately, statedly to church and sits at the table of the Lord, while among his positions are hidden unlawful gains, the things that God has cursed for a goodly Babylonish government. Multitudes sacrifice the approval of conscience and their hope of heaven. Multitudes barter their integrity and their capabilities for usefulness for a bag of silver shackles. The cries of the suffering poor are unheeded. The gospel light is in a hindered and is coarse. The scorn of worldling is kindled by practices that give the lie to the Christian profession. And yet the covetous professor continues to heap up treasures. This is not my words, but the pen of inspiration. Ellen G. White, she is giving that there are many Achans in the church of God. So as we are listening to this message this morning, Achan is one of the, you know, the options we may take. But we must be very careful. Why? Because whatever we desire in mind will come out as an action. That's why I would say clothing governs behavior. So let us put the robe of righteousness, the robe of Jesus Christ on us. So that instead of do, doing this, stealing tithe and offerings or, you know, never giving charities or giving good services to the poor people, we shouldn't be. Okay, the next person. That is Eliza and Elisha. This morning, as this wonderful song, the mission was proclaimed by this big gentleman, Mr. Joel, I was really touched. And then we have to remember... Elijah's mission was over. He was the hero on the Mount Carmel, and against him was 850, you know, evil idolaters and the leaders of spirit, evil spirit. But he was alone, yet he conquered everything, and he was the victor and warrior in the battle. And this man of God, and as he was raptured, by the firing chariot of God, and now coming up to the heaven. And somehow, something was left behind. That was the mantle of Elijah. And this young man, I don't know how old he was, but you know, he was asking, my father and my father, I need a power from you. Double portion of your power. And this mentor was left. And this man took it. You see, I want to read this. Elisha took hold of his own clothes and rent them into, in two pieces. He took up also the mentor of Eliza that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. In other words, he gave up his own clothes, Elisha clothes, my fashion, I centeredness. Elisha is trying to be changed as he was looking for the double portion of the Elijah. Oh Lord, please give me the power, even this mantle of him, man of God, I must put on because my earthliness, my worldliness, my eye centeredness, my selfishness, and my fashion must be gone. That's why not only throw, here's that he rent them in two pieces. And then he took 
the mantle of Elijah. And as he was wearing, and you know, with this clothes, and as he was smote the water of Jordan, it split into two, which was showing the power of God. The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. How much you and I are desiring to be pulled with this powerful spirit of God. You know, I, I told you, whenever I'm wearing this, by the way, the first week in, in August, the thousand mm will celebrate the 30th anniversary and I will be attending there. Then, of course, I'll be wearing this with other officers and, you know, man. I want to reignite the mission spirit in my heart as I wear this. Because the clothing governs behavior. The next one. That was what? Subject to bleeding for 12 years, a woman who reached Jesus with the multitudes. But he, she was not able to reach. But you know, honestly speaking, she was standing there with about, you know, less than I think a meter. Because your, your, your length of the one, one hand could be maybe about 70, 80 centimeters, less than one meter. Since she was able to touch the garment, the edge of the garment of Jesus, it seems that she was very close to Jesus Christ. But instead of calling him, him and you know, asking him utterly, please, Lord, save me. I'm sick. I'm dying. But instead, she was just reaching out and stretching out and touched the garment of Jesus. Because she believed only by doing this deal, I could be healed. So the action was out of her little faith. By the way, here, message is clear. If you and I have the faith and try to reach the garment of Jesus, which is the robe of righteousness, robe of white, and all the saints will be given this wonderful clothes, this is from God. And immediately the, the, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. In other words, when you and I really try to touch the garment of Jesus, His glory and His forgiveness and His Messianic function, if you and I really desire to touch even the garments of Jesus, immediately we'll be healed. And it should be based on our faith because Jesus said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Nothing else. It's not by touch. But your faith, which what ignites your, your behavior and finally reaching out and touch my garments, that faith made you whole. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. My dear brothers and sisters, today I want to have this kind of faith. Higher level of faith. The very last one. A really important message today. You know, in the book of Revelation, the first, second, and third, three chapters, especially two and three, these two chapters are talking about the seven churches in Asia. Uh, and then we know that we, we are in the very last church, right? Laodicea church. But the fifth church, the church of Sardis, this was the message. Let me read. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And to the Laodiceans, you and I, we look at church, but God is again giving us a very special message to the last church. Because you say, I'm rich, have become wealthy, and have needed of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me 
gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salt that you may see. My dear brothers and sisters, through today's uh, message, we need to learn this. Truly, clothing governs our behavior. And I hope on Sabbath days, and I hope in your own home. Do not try to wear like a worldly people. We must be different from them. Because our spirit, our life goal is different. They're looking for the land of Egypt, but we are looking for the land of promise, land of Canaan. That's why we must have different spirit and different practice. So, as we look at this, I already told you, from the beginning till the end, all the, you know, the pictures in the Bible, Old Testament, even whether in the New Testament, they were wearing the robe of righteousness. Although they are filthy and wrecked, you know, they are dirty, but they always desired to be white, to be righteous. When we have this desire, God will transform us. Yes, truly, it is the history of clothing. Man, human beings are always trying to cover us. But we cannot cover us just like Adam and Eve with the red olive trees, leaves. Soon when the sun is coming up, you know, it will dry up and crunchy and it will be broken down. We cannot cover our sin and our wrongdoings. But when we are covered by the skin of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the robe of righteousness, yes, will be able to change our behavior according to the will of God. May God bless all of us as we are remembering this message. Today, the clothing governs behavior. Amen. Uh, now it's time for offerings. Deacon and Deacon is, is collecting offerings. Yeah, if you want to give offerings by uh, church bank account, uh, please find the information on the screen and Kakao Talk, the SUIC chat room. Thank you for the um, uh, Heavenly Father. Thank you for the message that I received this morning. Let us be like a good field when we hear the word. Let us know your will by through your word. Let us follow your life, your way. Let us obey your words. Now we offer you real things we have. Please receive our offerings and our heart and bless each one of us. We hope and pray all of these offerings will be used for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.
Church, let us stand and sing our closing hymn, Lord, make us more holy. God of heaven, God of mercy, and God of salvation, eternal Savior, oh, Father, we want to thank you for the message that we could listen to you this morning. Lord, please make us more holy, more faithful, more humble, and more loving until we meet again. By covering ourselves with the robe of righteousness, which is the garment of Jesus Christ, so that we'll be able to shine our Christian light to the world, so many people will be drawn into the kingdom of God. Bless all thy children of SUIC and all youth and all others, and be with them from now on forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.